On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we tell the story of Tequila Suter, a 26-year-old woman who was murdered on February 15, 2014, in Lackawanna, New York. The day she was found, Tequila was supposed to attend church, but when her friend arrived to pick her up, she didn't answer the door. When her friend gained access to the apartment, Tequila is found in her bedroom, dead. She had been stabbed 39 times. Immediately, investigators believe that Tequila was killed by someone close to her. As they took a closer look at the people in Tequila's life, it didn't take them long to identify who that person was. This is Tequila's story. Tequila Suter was born on November 13, 1987, in Oakland, California. But when she was still really young, her family moved to New York State. When they first moved, they lived in New Fame, New York, but eventually moved to a nearby town called Lockport, where they settled. For elementary school, Tequila attended Anna Merritt Elementary School and then North Park Junior High. After that, she attended Lockport High School, where she graduated from. The people closest to her described her as a caring, compassionate person who was born a leader. After she graduated from high school, Tequila began working at a local nursing home as a dietary aide, and then she later worked at a daycare. According to her family, working with children was her true passion. Eventually, that passion led her to Lackawanna, where she moved and began working at Baker Victory Services, where she worked as both a mentor and a counselor for the young people the program served. Outside of work, Tequila also attended church regularly and was an active member of her church community. She led praise and worship and danced, and, of course, because of her love for children, participated in the children's ministry also. She was someone who people could depend on, especially her church family. At some point, Tequila decided that she wanted to go back to college. She decided that she would major in criminal justice and child psychology. In the beginning of 2014, by all accounts, Tequila was living a happy life in Lackawanna, working and going to school and church. Although there isn't much information about Tequila's personal life, we do know that at the time she was dating a young man named Damone Hall. It's not clear how or when the two met, but Damoni was a few years younger than Tequila, but he was described by people who knew him as a nice young man who attended church regularly. Tequila was living a pretty normal, seemingly uneventful life when 2014 started, but in February of that year, everything changed. On Friday, February 14th, 2014, Tequila discovered some suspicious activity on her bank account. There were withdrawals that she did not recognize, and she suspected that it was fraud. And so at around 3.30 p.m. on the 14th, Tequila contacted the Lagwana Police Department to report the suspicious activity. The detective who answered her phone call said that he was preparing to leave for the weekend, and so when he spoke to Tequila, he told her that he would follow up with her on Monday. The fact that Tequila contacted the police is a clear indication that she did not think that this withdrawal was some sort of accident or a mistake. She was concerned enough about it to call the police right away. On Sunday, February 16th, 2014, Tequila was supposed to go to church as she always did on Sunday. A friend of hers that also attended the same church was going to pick her up so they could drive together. Her girlfriend arrived that morning to pick Tequila up, but when she got to her home and knocked on the door, Tequila didn't answer. She tried to call her phone, but there was still no answer. Almost immediately, she knew that something was wrong because Tequila never missed church. She knew that she was going to be there to pick her up, and so she would have been ready. The fact that she wasn't answering the door or her phone was alarming. So after not being able to get a hold of Tequila, 
her friend decided to call her brother. At the time, her brother was working for Tequila's landlord, and he had a key to the apartment. She told him that Tequila wasn't answering the phone and asked him to come over there to let her in so that she could check on her. When the friend's brother got to the apartment, he knocked on the door, but there was still no answer. And so he used his key and unlocked the door. He entered the apartment and walked to where Tequila's bedroom was. And that's where he found her, lying face down on the floor, covered in blood. Her friend's brother called 911. He told the 911 operator that he found Tequila on the floor and there was blood everywhere. When police arrived at Tequila's apartment, it was obvious that she had been murdered. The blood around her had dried, indicating that she had been lying there for several hours before she was found. When detectives took a closer look at Tequila's body, they could see that she had been stabbed multiple times, with a lot of the wounds concentrated around her neck. They could tell right away that this was a brutal murder, and it looked personal. Now, despite the fact that there was a significant amount of blood around Tequila's body, detectives said that they found it suspicious that there wasn't visible blood any other place in the apartment. With so many stab wounds, investigators believe that there should be more blood And so, as a part of their investigation of the crime scene, they sprayed luminol in different places around the apartment. If you don't know what luminol is, it's a chemical that, when placed under UV light, can reveal blood. Even after it's been cleaned up. And so, when the luminol is sprayed in the bathroom, it lit up. In 2021... Tequila's story was featured on ID channel's See No Evil, and in that episode, they showed the actual crime scene photos from the bathroom, and you can clearly see what looks like bloody shoe prints all over the bathroom floor. After the luminol was tested, and investigators now knew that whoever murdered Tequila had attempted to clean up the scene, and that was confirmation that This was not a random crime. They knew from the stab wounds that this was likely personal, and so the attempted cleanup only added to that theory. But the cleanup also meant that there was evidence that was gone, and that would ultimately make it more difficult for the investigators to find the killer. After processing the crime scene, Detectives turned to neighbors of Tequila's to see if anyone had seen or heard anything. There was also a health center near the apartment that had surveillance cameras outside. And so detectives visited the clinic to review their cameras. But unfortunately, the angle didn't capture anything outside Tequila's apartment. With no witnesses and no surveillance footage, Detectives knew that they were going to have to take a deep dive into Tequila's life to see if there was anyone she knew who may have wanted to kill her. When the autopsy was performed, it was determined that Tequila had been stabbed 39 times. It was overkill, and whoever had done it had wanted to make sure that she died. The question was, who hated her enough to stab her that many times? Detectives found out that Tequila had been dating Demoni. Coincidentally, several of the police officers in Lackawanna knew him when he was a basketball player in high school and knew him to be quiet. But him being Tequila's boyfriend meant that they needed to speak to him to see what he knew. And so they contacted Demoni and he agreed to come into the police station and speak to them. On the episode of See No Evil, they show parts of the interview. In the footage, Demoni appears calm, and one of the detectives said that he was polite. He tells them that he was at church when he found out that something had happened to Tequila. He said a fellow member of the church tapped him on the shoulder and told him that they were going to pray because something had happened to her. Damoni said that the last time he saw Tequila was on February 15th, the day before her body was found. He admitted to detectives that 
they had been arguing and were basically breaking up. He told them that at about 4.30, he started to collect his things that he had at the apartment. He said that he was still trying to talk to her, telling her that they could still work things out. Damoni said that he told Tequila that he would be back in the morning to get the rest of his things because he didn't want to upset her. He said that he put some of his stuff in a bag and left the apartment at around 5.30 p.m. And when he last saw her, Tequila was on her phone. After leaving the apartment, Damoni said that he went down the street to a local store and bought a couple of things. He said that he was trying to figure out where he was going to stay. And so he called a friend of his to ask for a ride because he didn't have money for a taxi. He said the friend picked him up and dropped him off at a bus station downtown where he took a bus to a female friend's house where he stayed the night. While at the friend's house, Damoni said that he and Tequila were talking. They were communicating via text and Facebook, and Tequila was making it clear that she wanted to end their relationship. Damoni, however, was doing everything he could to change her mind. After police finished interviewing him, Damoni left the station, and detectives began to look into his alibi to see if they could corroborate what he had told them. The first thing they did was check the surveillance footage at the store where Damoni said he had gone after leaving Tequila's apartment. When they viewed the footage from inside the store, they saw Damoni entering at around the time he said. He had a black backpack on and he was carrying a white plastic bag. The footage captured him making purchases and then exiting the store. After they reviewed the footage, they next wanted to see the camera footage from the bus that Damoni said that he took after being dropped off. When investigators contacted the bus company to request the footage, they were told that it would take a few days before they could get it. And while investigators waited for the footage, they were able to obtain a copy of Tequila's phone records, and they were able to see and read the text between Tequila and Damoni, and it confirmed what Damoni told them. When the surveillance footage from the bus came back, that too corroborated his story. The footage showed him get on the bus where he sat and then get off at the location he said he did. At that point, investigators had been able to confirm the things that Damoni told them, and so it looked like he had told them the truth. And so they began to focus their attention on other possible suspects. It was still early in the investigation, but investigators were having a hard time finding a motive. Why would someone want to kill Tequila? As the investigation continued, detectives and Tequila's family began to realize that their killer was closer to her than they knew. On February 16th, 2014, 26-year-old Tequila Suter was found murdered inside her apartment in Lackawanna, New York. She had been stabbed 39 times. As the investigation began, detectives were having trouble finding their suspect and a motive until they started to take a closer look. In the days following Tequila's murder, investigators were having trouble finding a suspect or any leads that would point them towards a suspect. As word of her murder spread throughout the community, people who knew Tequila were shocked. She was someone who people knew to be kind and helpful. It was unimaginable that someone would come into her home and stab her 39 times. It didn't make sense, and neither her family or detectives could figure out why. With detectives hitting a dead end in those first few days, they decided to go and speak to Damoni's friend, the one whose house he said he stayed at on the 15th after he left to kill his apartment. Even though surveillance footage had confirmed much of what he told detectives, with so few leads, they needed to make sure that Damoni had told them the whole truth. Detectives went over to the home of Damoni's friend to speak to her. Once there, they discovered that her cousin also lived with her. 
And so they asked both women if they would be willing to come to the station to speak to them about that night. And the women agreed. Once at the station, the women told detectives that Damoni had come there and spent the night, like he said, and he didn't leave until Sunday afternoon. The detectives asked if he had had anything with him when he arrived, and the women told detectives that he had a black backpack when he got to their place. But from the surveillance footage, detectives knew that Damoni had also been carrying a white plastic bag, But when they asked his friend and her cousin, she said that he did not have a white plastic bag when he got to their apartment. Detectives thought that it was odd that he had had this plastic bag with him in every video they found of him on the 15th, but then when he arrived at his friend's house, he didn't have it. They, of course, had no way of knowing what was inside the bag or whether or not it was significant, but they also wanted to find the bag and see what was inside. They asked Damoni's friend if he had anything else with him, like a cell phone or any other personal belongings. And his friend told them that Damoni actually had two cell phones when he came over, one black and one white. The description of the white cell phone immediately sparked the detective's interest because they had been unable to find Tequila's white cell phone. And Damoni, in his interview with them, had not mentioned a second cell phone. When investigators finished interviewing the friend and her cousin, they decided to go back to the surveillance footage from the bus and take a closer look at what Damoni was doing during the ride. When they look at the footage again, they could see what looked like a white cell phone in his hand. And once they saw that phone, Damoni became their prime suspect. They believed that he had lied to them about seeing Tequila last on her phone and that he had taken her phone from her apartment. They didn't know exactly why he had taken the phone, but they had a pretty good feeling about why. In order to find out more about the phone from Damoni, they brought him back in for questioning. They asked him about the cell phone, and he told them that when he got to the bus station that evening, that he had found it on the ground. They asked him where the phone was now, and he told them that it didn't work, and so he had thrown it away. The problem was, Damoni's friend and her cousin said that he had the phone when he got to their apartment and was using it all night. And so the detectives knew for sure that he was lying about the phone. At that point, the detectives interviewing him began to put pressure on Damoni to see if he would confess. But he denied that he killed Tequila. He maintained his story and said that he had nothing to do with what happened. After the police turned up the heat, Damoni asked for a lawyer. The detectives working the case were hoping that the pressure they were putting on him would get him to confess. At that point, they were 100% sure that he was their killer, but they did not have enough evidence to arrest him. Even if they could prove that the cell phone was in his possession, they needed more. And so after interviewing Damoni for the second time, Detectives turned their attention to the missing white plastic bag. They needed evidence that Damoni couldn't make an excuse for, and they believed that it was inside that bag. So investigators began searching the area near where Damoni had gotten off the bus. Since they knew that he had gotten off the bus with the bag, but did not arrive at the friend's house with it, meant that he had discarded it somewhere between. And so they searched every trash can and area where someone would discard trash. If they couldn't find the entire bag, they at least wanted to find the contents of the bag, or some of it. A smoking gun. Now, after finding nothing in the cans along the route to Damoni's friend's apartment, they decided to go there and look in the trash cans behind her building. When investigators opened the cans and take out one of the bags, 
Underneath, they found the white plastic bag identical to the one that Damoni had been seen carrying that night. When they took the bag out and opened it, inside, they found several items, all covered in blood, including a disposable mop head, men's clothing, and a woman's jacket. They also found two knives. On February 27th, 13 days after Tequila was brutally stabbed to death, Damoni Hall was arrested and charged with her murder. The detective's theory was that Tequila had confronted Damoni over the missing money from her account and that they got into an argument that turned violent. And in a rage, Damoni grabbed a knife and stabbed Tequila to death. They then believed that he cleaned up the crime scene and then took her phone. After she was dead, they said that Damoni then used to kill his phone to access Facebook and send messages to himself to make it appear as if he was talking to Tequila, when in fact, it was his attempt to create an alibi and give the appearance that she was still alive when he last saw her. After his arrest, Detectives continued to search for Tequila's phone, and they ended up finding it, solidifying their theory of the case. After Damoni was arrested, it was a shock to those who knew him and Tequila. He was known as a quiet, church-going young man. He didn't seem like the type to do something like this. The prosecution, however, had overwhelming amounts of evidence against him. They not only had the cell phone and the records, they also had DNA on the bloody items found inside the plastic bag. They had a strong case. And so, instead of going to trial, in December 2014, Damoni Hole pled guilty to murdering Tequila. And in January 2015, he was sentenced to 20 years to life. He will be eligible for parole in 2034, and he's currently serving his sentence at Attica Prison. The murder of Tequila Suter is a brutal one. I'm sure she never thought ending her relationship with Damoni would end with her life being taken. Although the detectives and prosecutors had their theories of why Damoni killed Tequila, it's not really clear why in that moment he decided to destroy so many lives. At 26 years old, Tequila had made such a lasting impact on the people who knew her and loved her, and what happened to her was not fair. She deserved so much more. Nothing that happened that night was worth her life, and for Damoni, it wasn't worth throwing his life away. But He is in prison, and justice in this case was served. Hopefully knowing that her killer has been held accountable for what he did brings some comfort to Tequila's family and friends. May Tequila Suter rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads.